Welcome to another edition of Zeek in Action. I'm your host, Richard Baitlick, and in today's video, we're going to be talking about how to run Brim inside the Windows Sandbox. I got this idea from uh, Tony E. on Twitter this morning. Uh, I noticed that he had posted a link to a blog post uh, by Eric over at uh, NetResec, who is the creator of Network Miner. And it, uh, the highlight here said, uh, Network Miner can be run in a highly efficient Windows sandbox in order to analyze malicious PCAP files in Windows. And I had not heard of Windows Sandbox. And I'm sure some of you have and have used it, but this was something that was new to me. And the reason why this caught my attention was that there could be a problem when you're analyzing network traffic or binaries or any other type of digital artifact. The problem could be that this digital artifact, this digital evidence, could have malicious content in it such that when it is processed by one of your network security monitoring tools, it could uh, exploit a vulnerability in that software. Now, we've seen this all over the internet uh, for the last uh, month plus uh, via Log4j, but there's been many examples of this over the years. Uh, for example, something as complicated as Wireshark, uh, although the programmers try to be very careful, uh, if there's some type of uh, vulnerability in the code when you're reading in a PCAP, potentially you could take over the system, or at least you could exploit Wireshark and gain uh, user privileges or however you're running Wireshark on a system. Uh, I'm not picking on Wireshark here, I'm just using that as an example that uh, because it is possible to exploit something that is reading in uh, users supplied content. This doesn't have to happen with uh, dead files either. It can happen in a live context. So you could have something like uh, many years ago, Snort had a vulnerability like that, or ISS Real Secure had a vulnerability. Um, so one of the ways you could possibly mitigate this is by analyzing your artifacts inside of a sandbox. And it makes it a little bit more difficult for the intruder because if they end up exploiting the vulnerable code you're using to look at the, the evidence, then they have to break out of the sandbox as well in order to get to the next step, which is obviously your machine and going farther than that. So that's why this caught my attention. Now, I took a look at a, a couple of uh, sites that had some information about making sure that your system could run Windows Sandbox. And one of the recommendations was to run systeminfo.exe as an administrator and see what it had to say about hypervisor. Uh, now, I don't know if I was looking at out-of-date information or if it just doesn't really matter. But uh, when I first saw the results that you see here on the bottom of the screen, I was not exactly thrilled. It said uh, Hyper-V requirements, a hypervisor has been detected, features required for Hyper-V will not be displayed. Now, I didn't know if that was good or bad uh, because <laughs> the sources that I was reading uh, talked about showing that your hypervisor was supported in the firmware and it had more information. This sounded like it was okay, but I did some searching and found that people had had some issues, so I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen. I also uh, ran services.exe as administrator, and I saw that uh, there were a bunch of Hyper-V services that you see listed there. Uh, none of them were running, and they all said that they were a startup type manual with a trigger start. Again, I didn't know if this was good or bad. I just decided to accept it as it was and, uh, and move from there. So uh, I went to Windows, uh, I went to the Microsoft documentation on Windows Sandbox and I followed the instruction. I, I try to, when I'm enabling different features on Windows, I try to use PowerShell if at all possible because it makes it easier to document what I'm doing. So I found the uh, command uh, that Microsoft recommended running to enable Windows Sandbox. And you'll see it there at the bottom of the screen, uh, enable Windows optional feature, feature name, containers, disposable client VM. Uh, so I decided to do that, and then it prompted me to uh, reboot, which I did. Now, I reran uh, systeminfo.exe. I still got the same message about Hyper-V, so I was not, again, I was not thrilled about this. I didn't know if it would necessarily work or not. Uh, however, in the start menu, I could now see Windows Sandbox is being installed. So the question was, would it work? So I clicked on Windows Sandbox. And it started. So it seemed like everything was cool. So I decided, OK, this is the setup for getting Windows uh, Sandbox running on my system. By the way, this is just uh, my uh, Windows 10 laptop. Uh, it is running Windows 10 Pro. Uh, apparently, Windows Sandbox is not 
uh, shipped with uh, the home edition. I guess that that makes sense. Most home users would not be interested in this. So uh, it's just another reason why if you're going to have your own laptop, it's always a good idea to uh, get the Pro Edition if you can. So that's where we're at. And at that point, let's go into a uh, live demonstration here of what we're looking at. Uh, by the way, here is the here's a tweet from uh, Tony E. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. And I think uh, NetResec uh, retweeted that, which is how it came into to my feed. This is the uh, post. This is actually from May of last year, of running Network Miner in Windows Sandbox. And uh, Eric uh, takes a little bit of a more complicated, uh, a little more elegant, a little more uh, refined approach to running this. Uh, he actually shows how to create a configuration file that will install um, whatever tool you want to use each time you boot up Windows Sandbox. I didn't do that here. Uh, it's not strictly necessary. Uh, but if this is something you're interested in, perhaps you could use Eric's example here uh, for inspiration. So I am going to start Windows Sandbox and show you how that looks. There it is. It's a very inspired logo. Sort of reminds me of... Uh, uh, MS DOS days, but that's okay. And there we have it. There is Windows Sandbox, which that's pretty cool. Um, if I were to check to see if uh, Hyper-V is running, I did this in a, a previous uh, test and I saw that some of the Hyper-V components, at least one of them, the host component I believe was running, but it appears that it's working. So let's go ahead and see if we can get uh, Network Miner running on it. Now, one of the things you have to do is you have to provide the uh, installation executable in order for this to run. So that's the next thing we're going to step. Uh, I'm sorry, I said I said Network Miner. I meant Brim. We're going to stick with Brim for this because uh, this is the Zeek in action and uh, Network Miner doesn't support Zeek. Maybe we'll take a look at it at, at another time. Uh, Network Miner is a fine tool in its own respect. I've used it uh, for many years, although not recently, but I have used it before and profiled it in my books, I believe. So if you go to brimdata.io and we click on download, and we're going to download the Windows version, and I'm going to right click, and I'm going to save this to my desktop just to make it easier. I am definitely not the type of person who saves things to the desktop, but for this demo, it's going to be uh, make it a little bit easier for us. And the reason that is, is now that uh, it's been downloaded to the desktop, and and by the way, don't be confused here. This ins instance of Brim is installed on my local system. Uh, this Brim setup is the setup.exe. Um, I, I thought perhaps I could just sort of drag it, but it doesn't allow me to do that, which is kind of odd. What I have to do is I can right click, I can copy it, and then I come into my Windows sandbox, and I right click and I paste. And now it is copying that uh, Brim setup uh, version two, er, uh, .28. Dot zero to the system. Um, I'm surprised they don't allow just dragging and dropping, but that's okay. That this works just as well. So now I have Brim setup uh, copied the ex executable copied into this Windows sandbox, and I'm going to make this just a little bit larger here. And I'm going to double click, and we're going to install this. Now I hope it's doing something. Maybe it's not. There we go. So we say agree. Hope it's not installing twice. No, it looks like it's okay. Uh, I haven't done much with uh, Brim 0 0.28 yet. Uh, my initial looks at it appear or appear to show that it's similar or the same as the previous versions as far as the interface goes. I know the Brim team has been doing a lot of work under the hood, uh, even repositioning the way the product uh, works. Uh, but for our purposes, I don't think, uh, in, in other words, looking at Zeek logs from PCAPs, we don't need to really worry about that. So here's the release notes for um, Brim 
0 0.2, uh, excuse me, 0 0.28.0, which came out a few months ago, or at least a few weeks ago. Okay, so here we are, and the next question, oh, look at that. Is that, I wonder if that is from the, yeah, virus and threat protection is not turned on in this instance of Windows Sandbox, so uh, I'm not going to really worry about that now. So now that the question is, well, how do I get PCAPs into this instance of Brim in order to take a look at them? Well, we're going to use a similar method to uh, what we did previously. Um, I am going to copy and paste a PCAP. So come back to my original machine and go to my downloads and we'll just grab this traffic analysis PCAP and I'm going to copy it, come back over here into Brim. Uh, I'm going to paste it to the desktop. I just can't uh, put it into Brim, but there it is. Move that one over. Now I'm going to drag into Brim and let it process that. One of the things I've wondered about with this software is, or with this version of Windows Sandbox is, uh, how does it handle load? Um, you know, I haven't tested this against my native machine, or I haven't tested uh, 2.8 against my native machine, so I don't know if this is significantly slower. Uh, I did look in the documentation and, and it talks about being able to increase the amount of RAM that's devoted to the Windows Sandbox, but it also talks about it dynamically scaling as the load is needed. So I don't really know, um, you know, if this is necessarily good or bad performance. But for our purposes, there we are. We have Brim running. I'm going to uh, zoom out just a bit. There we go. Increase the size of it just a bit here. And uh, here we are. Here, actually, we see a lot of alerts. So these are our uh, Suricata alerts on various activity. If I wanted to, let's say, look at, um, well, let's look at DNS. What do we have there? And let's pivot into one of these, perhaps. So here's some of the DNS logs uh, from the from the Zeek DNS log that Brim has created for us. So again, why would we do something like this? We're doing this because imagine that we're uh, there's a vulnerability in in Brim, or there's a vulnerability in the version of Zeek that it uses, or there's a, ver a vulnerability in the version of the uh, Suricata instance that it's using. And with that possibility, if we were to read in a PCAP and it had traffic or however content that was generated by an intruder designed to exploit that vulnerability, potentially uh, you could trigger the vulnerability in the, in the code and cause the intruder to start executing code on your, on your system. And the thing they would want to do next, obviously, is to establish uh, command and control, which you could have mitigating factors in place, of course. Uh, but yeah, th this is an example of if, if you're dealing with something that uh, it's almost like the, the idea of not just, not just uh, taking a random USB stick and plugging it into your computer. Uh, if you're going to investigate something like that, you should have systems that are systems and processes, honestly, that are designed to deal with, with uh, the possibility of malicious code. So is this the type of thing that I would recommend doing all the time? Probably not. Uh, if you're working with something that has defied your analysis previously or has been suspicious previously, or for whatever reason, um, maybe you don't know the provenance of the data you're receiving. So for example, uh, years ago when I was consulting, uh, I would get data from clients who said, uh, take a look at this and see what you can find. I knew nothing about it, so I treated it as it was potentially hostile. And this is one way you could potentially uh, mitigate that. So this is uh, using, you know, using Brim within Windows Sandbox. I also wanted to show, well, can we run something else inside Windows Sandbox? So we're going to try doing that as well. And I am going to go to Wireshark. And let's go ahead and download the Windows 64-bit installer for Wireshark. And that probably went into my downloads folder. It did. So I'm going to copy that. And we'll put it into Windows Sandbox. Mm, 
and let's see what happens here if we install Wireshark. And it's going to install NPCAP as well. All right, let's see what happens. I do like the way Microsoft is incorporating these sorts of technologies into Windows. Um, you could argue that, oh, it just makes Windows more complicated. And as a result, the surface area for exploitation has increased. And yes, that is true. Um, Let's go ahead and accept the NP cap. Let's see. Uh, so, so eh, no, we don't need any of that. Um, this is just a demo, and and actually, we'll show you what happens once I stop running Windows uh, Windows Sandbox. So, honestly, what I'm choosing here doesn't make uh, make uh, much of a difference, and that's part of the the reason why we're doing this. Okay, finish. That installed NPCAP. NPCAP is the packet capture library that uh, is recommended to be used with Wireshark these days. And there we go. Finish. Now let's go ahead. Remember, this is the executable uh, installation. This is the shortcut to start Wireshark itself. So there we go, that's pretty cool. Now, this is gonna be an interesting question. What will this actually see? What kind of network traffic, what, what kind of interfaces does this have? What network, yeah, see, let's, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and start a capture. What am I seeing? I don't know if I'm seeing anything actually because of the way this might be set up. In fact, Oh, there we go. Now we got some traffic. And yeah, this is it. Let's see, where is it going? So this 172.24 address, I'm assuming this is the address of my Windows Sandbox. And there it is, 172.24, 179, 161. So we've got uh, a call out here to a Windows box. Now let's see if I were to visit some websites here. Let's go to zeek.org. All right, Zeek website. And let's go back to live traffic. And Yeah, so that's pretty interesting. So I am able to capture traffic uh, while this is running. Now this would be useful, by the way, if you were examining some evidence and you wanted to find out if something were causing your system to reach out to the internet. You could potentially run Wireshark here and just watch that. Again, this isn't something I tend to do. I would not, I don't like to use systems to monitor themselves. I would much prefer to have a system outside of this one that is watching traffic. That way that system is uh, completely unaffected by anything that happens on this particular system. Uh, now, given that this is Windows Sandbox, my native underlying system would also be watching the network traffic. So that might be another place you could watch for outbound network traffic uh, if you so desired. So um, now this is where we're gonna demonstrate the utility of this setup. So I'm going to quit my uh, Wireshark instance. Go ahead and we'll quit uh, Brim. And I'm going to just close Windows Sandbox. And it says, are you sure you want to close Windows Sandbox? Once Windows Sandbox is closed, all of its content will be discarded and permanently lost. Yes, that is the point. Goodbye to Windows Sandbox. So now, if I run it again, start it up. This is another reason why you might want to use sandbox technology. Every time you start your sandbox, it begins in a clean state. Nothing has been installed, no changes have been made. So here we have 
Windows Sandbox, and it is just the way it was before I installed Brim, before I installed uh, Wireshark. This is another reason why Sandbox technology is popular with people who do any type of reverse engineering or malware analysis or any of those sorts of tasks where they want to start with a known good state. It's one of the reasons why whenever I use VirtualBox or VMware or whatever, I'm often taking snapshots, particularly at the beginning of any investigation, because I want to be able to revert back to that initial clean state and to be able to uh, track changes as necessary later on. So if I needed to run uh, another set of analysis, I would have to reinstall my tools. So for example, if I, um, I could either copy the Brim setup, uh, copy and paste it here into Windows Sandbox, or potentially I could inside Windows Sandbox um, go to the Brim website and download the executable there if I wanted to. And then I would install it and so forth. This is the reason why Eric has a configuration file to automatically install um, Network Miner every time you start Windows Sandbox so that you don't have to do these kinds of steps manually. That would have been a less exciting to look at. Uh, that would have been you know, double clicking and suddenly you have an environment where everything is running. But if you want to be able to do this uh, on a regular basis, that is the approach that I recommend that you take so that you, do <clears throat> you don't have to do all these steps uh, manually every time. And I bet it put it in the downloads folder. Yeah, there's Brim set up in the downloads folder. Okay. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this presentation of how to get the Windows Sandbox running on your system. Uh, it's not very complicated. Uh, I am a not very savvy Windows administrator, uh, and yet I was able to get Windows Sandbox running pretty easily using some uh, PowerShell that was listed on the reference site that I included in the slide. Um, if you if you're doing something like this, I'd be happy to hear uh, how you do your analysis. Uh, one of the best ways to do that is just to visit us at the uh, Zeek Slack channel uh, or go to the Zeek mailing list. Uh, but for now, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video and I look forward to seeing you on the next edition of Zeek in Action.